Father, we want to thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that we can always be together through technology, but ultimately we want to be together through the spirit, the presence, your gift, you being in us, and you bring your people together. You are sealing us. You are going throughout the earth seeing who is looking up, who is looking to Jesus. And we want to echo the call of all of the other uh, pulpits that are preaching the gospel, all the other ministries that are lifting up Jesus Christ. Lord, let our time together be a part of this cry that's getting louder and louder and louder until the doors of probation close. This is our prayer that this day will be a part of the cry. Praise to you and also preaching the gospel and changing our hearts, Lord, to be saved through Jesus. This is my prayer. And I believe if you're watching and if you're listening, it's your prayer. And we claim it in Jesus' name. Let's all say amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and get into the lesson for the day. Our lesson, again, this whole quarter, we've been focusing on the idea of winning or making friends for Jesus. And in this week's study, we talked about developing a winning attitude when it comes to trying to do that. Having a winning attitude is vital because we are realizing that it is our attitude that oftentimes dictates our altitude. What is our attitude when it comes to uh, being a witness or, or sharing Jesus? Well, we've always emphasized this and we've got to do it again you got to make sure that you've got a Jesus. you got to make sure that you've got a joy and a message worth sharing. And so that's something that happens in a one-on-one. That's between you and the Lord. And that experience reaches a point where, like a pot on a stove, it, you don't have to tell the pot to boil over if you give it enough heat. And when you've got that heat on your heart and you've got that fire in your bones like Jeremiah had, it's going to show in how we live. It's going to boil over into an outward revelation of what's going on inside. And so what we're talking about is how can we get our mindset with this Jesus joy in our heart to be in a way and in a place where we can be sharing Jesus and winning others to him just because of what's going on in our heart. So that's kind of giving us some backdrop where we're focusing as far as um, what the Lord has put on our heart in regards to developing a winning attitude. So Let's go to our lesson text here in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15. We'll read it here. It says what, everybody? Let's read it together. Let's wake up. Let's be alive. Saying what? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. We'll talk about that this afternoon. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. This is our joy, not our job, our joy. See, because of the work of the spirit, that work that is done through its power, we don't have jobs. We just get joy when we allow the spirit to do what we cannot do. And one of the things that the Lord has promised to do for us is to sanctify, but we have to allow that sanctification to take place. When we do that, one of the fruits we see here in first Peter is that you'll always be ready to explain what's going on inside of you. <laughs> now, I know it there. It says, give the fence to everyone or for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yes, there is the apologetic aspect um, to being a Christian. And when we think of apology, normally we think of, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I, please forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. But that the idea of the word, the theological term, the apologetic uh, comes from that Greek word, apologia, uh, which has to deal with defending or explaining or debating. So an apologetic in the Christian sense or theological sense, it's someone who's defending their faith. So to be apologetics, it's a part of what we are as Christians in a sinful world. We've got to defend our faith, but understand that we're not fighting for God in the purest sense. In other words, that he needs our help. I don't know what to do if I don't have Chris. No, he doesn't need us to fight his battles. But as apologetics, we are letting God sanctify our hearts. And when we do that by letting him do that, we will have a reason. We'll always have an explanation. We'll always have a testimony or a song, whatever the case might be. We won't be coming up short when it comes to sharing. 
because it's something that's happening in our heart. This is the promise that we have here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And what we want to look at when we go to our lesson today is to realize how Jesus ministered will explore and exploring more deeply Jesus's attitude towards people and to discover how these principles apply in our own lives. See, that's the key. It's not just about trying to win souls to get a baptism or to have credit for something that we've done. We try to transcend that because that works. That's not God's goal in saving us. His goal is that we would reflect him. That's the whole purpose of why he saved us. We were created, the Bible says, unto good works. And those works were to happen even before sin even came on the scene. And ministry, as we understand it, is just something that we've had to do now because man got lost and now we're part of the saving process. But we were created to do good works even before sin came into the picture. And that was the what? The reflecting the character of Christ perfectly and eternally. So now in this sense, this is why we are going way beyond just trying to get folks baptized. We're talking about reflecting the character of Christ today. And we can do that with Jesus's attitude. So let's go into Sunday's lesson when we're talking about receptivity to the gospel. Hmm. Receptivity meaning being open, being available or willing. Well, it uses the story here. We begin in John chapter four, which is the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. And the question that's being posed to us is looking at how Jesus interacted with the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well, which is what I like to call her. Um, how does it demonstrate the truth of that all sorts of people are open to the gospel? In other words, when we think about our mission, or what it means to be a Christian at home, at church, at school, at work, wherever. We got to understand that we've got a product that people already want. People already need it, but they may not know it. They may not be aware of it. It's kind of like imagine if you were to go back in time and you went back in your time machine and you saw everybody riding around in a horse and a buggy. You saw everybody pulling or pushing a cart or they had a mule in front. But you came there back from the future and you've got a car. You know how to make a car and you know how to produce a car. You would look at everybody with a different perspective because you're like, man, what? wait till I tell them about what I got, what I can make, what I can do. This is the frame of mind that we have as Christians when we understand what Jesus understood, which was, I got the product that everyone's, I see all y'all walking around here, pushing horses and buggies, pulling carts. I've got something more efficient called an automobile, an automobile that's just going to rock your world. It's going to change everything. And that's the attitude Jesus had when he saw this woman pushing her cart. He knew that I've got a ride for you. It's me. Let's go to John to find that out. John chapter four. John chapter four. And uh, what we're going to do here, make sure I go to the right window. There we go. Remember, if you're watching us via changeministry.org, you can always click on here now or later to watch the studies. And we want to remind you too to jump in here. And if you want to drop us a text while we're in the study, it comes directly to my phone directly to our uh, computer here, and we're able to talk if there's something that the Lord puts on your heart. But no pressure, just know that it's there. No pressure, right? Just a possibility. Let's go to John chapter four. John chapter four is where we find Jesus. And Jesus's attitude, Jesus's mentality was that I have what you need. I, I know, I know what you are looking for and I got it. And I'm ready to give it to you when you want it. See, in John chapter four, and that was my only concern, about um, going here, so making sure that we can get there fast. But if you can't get there online, guess what? We've got Bibles, John chapter four. And yeah, let's go down here and look at verse number 29. And 28 says, the woman left her water pot and went her way. She left her water pot and went her way saying what? Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? 
when Jesus was talking to her, he was bold enough to even say to the woman, when he said there up here in verse number uh, 14, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. Jesus knew what he had to offer. He knew what this person needed and what they wanted, even if they did not. So when you jump back over here to the lesson and realize it, hey, everybody, Jesus saw what the disciples did not see. Jesus saw receptive hearts and receptive hearts does not always mean the open heart. In other words, there are some people who do make it easy. They come right out and tell, you know, I'm hurting. Can you pray for me? You know what? I need a word of encouragement. Can you show me a verse? That happens. But the receptive heart is sometimes the individual who does not even recognize their need, but it does not mean they don't have a need. This is particularly true when you're dealing with children, when you're dealing with young people, teenagers, or even young adults. They may not be able to voice it, but their body language, their attitude, even their acting out is a way of telling you, I've got an itch that I can't scratch. And we as adults, we as parents and mentors and spiritual mature Christians, we've got to be at a point where we're not always waiting for people to go out and spell it out, A, B, C, this is what I need. There are times where even with your spouse, where your spouse or your significant other might be acting out, your friend may be carrying on. You're trying to figure out, man, what's wrong with her? What, what is his deal? The acting out is the way of telling you there's an itch that I can't scratch. There's a need that I have. I don't know how to share it with you. Hey, I may be having too much pride to even let you know that I have the need. But I'm, you, you're suffering and getting the wrath and the result of this. But I need you to help me, even if I can't say it. That's what a spiritual mature Christian does, because that is what Jesus did. Jesus was able to see receptive hearts in spite of what was coming out of the mouth or not coming out of the mouth. Because remember, when some people are going through their situation, they're not always verbose. They're not always expressive. Some people have the exact opposite reality. They shut down. They stop talking. They mute. And we've got to have a the gift which is why, again, we're remembering this is not us. It's not our wisdom, but the gift of the spirit that allows us now to see things that may not be said, to hear things that may not be seen and vice versa, because that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus's attitude towards people we see here when you look at what happened because of his seeing the need, even though she, the woman at the well, could not articulate it. And she definitely wasn't going to say what she needed, but he brought her to that point. Look at the result here in Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Excuse me, Acts chapter 8, verse 4 and 5 and 14. Look at what it says there. In the book of Acts, oops, cut off a number here. Let me try this again. There we go. Acts chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. It says there, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then went Philip down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Her experience from a Jesus who saw her receptive heart led now later on in the book of Acts, after the Pentecost and after the spreading of the gospel, even into this area where she called home, Philip was able to do a work because they were receptive to it. They were receptive because of Jesus's previous visit in John chapter eight to the John chapter four. And so it shows us again, like, wow, sometimes you just talking to one coworker is what will be the floodgate to open up and allow the whole office to become Christian or the whole office to at least respect your Christianity or will lead the whole classroom to be one to say, you know what, why is it that you don't do this on Sabbath? 
These are things that happen as a result of us seeing people's needs for them and not seeing them for their needs. I hope that makes sense to you because when we go on to the second day and going into Monday's lesson, we recognize now, okay, when I saw that, I realized I needed an attitude adjustment. I needed a shift because more often than not, I see the problem that people cause me more than the need that they have that's causing them to cause the problems they have for me. I hope you're catching that. When you're dealing with someone who has a certain way or has a certain mm, personality when it comes to what they do or how they work or whatever, a lot of times we will just focus on the trouble that they're causing us, but not recognize, again, they're acting out in some way. They're saying things that they're not saying. And because of what they're going through, that's why they're adding, acting or treating you this way. We've got to see the need, see what really is going on inside. So that takes an attitude adjustment, all right? So now let's talk about that because our attitude shifting, it says here, a contrast, a positive attitude and a belief in others draws them to us. We catch that? A positive attitude and believing in others draws them to us. In fact, it creates a friendship, a bond of friendship. And Jesus stated this principle beautifully when he says there in John 15, 15, hey, y'all, I no longer call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, friends. For all things I heard from my father, I have made known to you. He calls us friends. And this is powerful because the fact that Jesus calls us friends means that his whole perception of us is much different than what I, I know for me personally. I, let me say this. I know this is the truth for me. I know that Jesus's perception of me is vastly different than my perception of how he perceives me. And one of the ways I can catch myself, in fact, I had to do this yesterday. I was praying about some things that I wanted Jesus to do. And in my prayer, I was hoping that he would do it. Now, these were things that he had already promised. These are things in scripture that are outlined. I knew I don't have to hope. I just got to ask for this. But in my mind, I was hoping that he would do it because I didn't think I was good enough for him to do it. So the attitude was that I was looking at myself as a servant, I was looking at myself kind of like um, as 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 an outsider, not an outcast, but an outsider or an outlier. Like, you know, well, I hope you do this, Lord, but but if not, I understand because you know I know I that mentality. And he rebuked me. The Spirit came and started showing me some scriptures. Like you're you're not asking for something you should be hoping for. This is something I told you I would give you, and because you're just hoping what I already told you you have, that hurts my feelings. And I was looking at myself as a servant rather than in that instance. And with this situation, you know what? I'm his friend and I shouldn't just be hoping for this. I should be expecting this because that is what he says there in John 15. This is the shift now. This is the shift that we've got to start making when it comes to how we look at God looking at us which will impact how we start looking at other people too. See, these, these texts show us how Jesus dealt with people and he stretches people's faith based on what they are able to understand or what they're expecting to be, which is why your attitude, which is why how we perceive him looking at us is so important. If it's very small or narrow, it's going to restrict him to that. But if it's very broad and wide and that we understand the gospel and we understand how much he really loves us, it's not just a matter of us having a boldness, but we'll have a confidence that will breathe out to others when it comes to how we deal with them. That was a lot. And it may have been a little wordy, so let me not be wordy. Let's make sure we're getting in the word. And let's go here. I'd like for us to go, if we could, to Mark. 
Let me go to Matthew 15 first. Matthew 15, um, because I think that this story speaks more clearly to the point than the story of Mark. That's the story of um, Mary anointing Jesus' feet. Um, but this one here, I think, speaks more to the point where Jesus went thence and he went to the coast of Tyre and Sidon. So behold, a woman of Canaan or a Canaanite, not an Israelite, but a Canaanite comes out of the same coast, cries unto him, saying, Master, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. This woman had a daughter who was under demonic possession. Now, Jesus did not answer her a word. Talking about how we see how God sees us, okay? He didn't say anything to her. And his disciples came to him and said, send her away because she cried after us. So some period of time, it doesn't say exactly how long, but it got to the point where Jesus didn't say anything to her. And his disciples were telling him, tell this lady to go. But what is her attitude. He answered and said, I'm not sent, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came and she worshiped him. She worshiped a Jesus who didn't respond to her. She worshiped a Jesus in the midst of disciples who were telling her to go away. And she even worshiped and she prayed. Well, how do we know she worshiped and prayed? Because it says, she worshiped him saying, she's praying, right? So we think you know, your prayer is just long distance, but she's not praying in the, the purest sense and the or traditional sense, but she's praying because she's talking to the Lord. Look at her faith. She says, Lord, help me, help me. But then he answered in verse 26 and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Oh, but she says, she keeps praying and she said, truth, Lord, but the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Powerful, powerful faith. You want to talk about the centurion's faith? That was great. This, oh, that's why Jesus said and answered, oh, woman, great thy faith. <laughs> great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as you wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Talking about great faith, talking about attitude. She had a perception of Jesus that most people do not have. And I'll be totally transparent. She had a perception of Jesus that is not even an attitude that I always have. Her love for her daughter is what drew her to go through all of this. But at some point and at a certain level, she had to see something in Jesus to her that the disciples didn't see and that even Jesus was trying to hide through his silence, through his not responding to her. She knew, she said, no, 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 no. This man, there's something about him. He's my only hope. And I believe that there's something in him that if I hold on to that long enough, it's going to break through and I'm going to get what I'm seeking because he's the only one who has it. That kind of experience, that kind of attitude is what we have to have when it comes to how Christ deals with us. Understanding that I believe he loves me and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> yeah, you heard it right. Jesus loves me and there's nothing I can do about it. Now, I can reject that love. That's different. We're not talking about once saved, always saved. In other words, predestination, Calvinism. There's nothing that I can do to be lost. Oh yeah, you can be lost. But the Bible makes it very clear that we are not lost because Jesus does not throw out a lifeline. We are lost when we refuse to take hold of that lifeline. That's how a person is lost. So it's not the absence of God's love. It is the rejection of it is why we're lost. But if that's not my situation, hallelujah. And if you're watching this, that's probably the case. That is the truth. He loves me and there's nothing I can do about it. 
there's nothing I can do to alter that or to change that. And if that's really true, and if that's what I believe, like this Canaanite woman, like this woman who had a faith even greater than her disciples, his disciples, we can understand now that's what he needs me to hold on to right now. More than ever is the truth that he loves me. When this becomes the attitude of the Christian, it changes how we treat other people. Because what starts to happen, that's the kind of love that we start loving out to others. We stop telling people to be quiet. One way we tell people to be quiet, like the disciples did when they were saying, tell this woman to, to just be quiet, to stop. We tell people to be quiet when we don't treat them the way Jesus treats them. And that can manifest itself in a myriad of ways to where we don't listen to people, to where we shut people down or to when we push people away or to when we don't forgive people or to when we don't acknowledge people's needs or to when we simply don't listen. I'm talking to Chris now. We simply don't listen when someone asks for a certain thing and you bring them the wrong thing and you justify and you argue and say, well, I bought you da 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 But no, if I was really listening and if I was really tuning in and I cared, I would bring exactly what it is you asked me to do. This is, again, all the myriad of ways that we can find ourselves in need of an attitude adjustment. And the attitude adjustment does not come to us until like this Canaanite woman, we recognize the tenacious nature or the tenacity of Jesus's love to us and how it's greater than anything that we might ever see or anything that we might ever do. And in her case, she had a demonic and a, a depressed, a, a, a de, she had a demonic and possessed daughter and she had a Jesus who was saying nothing about it. But her faith was in his power and his love for her. And he honored that. And she was blessed and her daughter was delivered. This is the attitude adjustment that we want to undergo when we think about our, our, our um, goal of loving people and treating people the way Jesus treated them. It starts with a shift in how we understand Jesus treats us. It, it's not going to happen without that shift. That's why some of us are trying to change the way we like, okay, we make determinations. All right, today I'm going to be nice to my husband or all right, today I'm going to treat my son this way or whatever. And then we blow it, right? We blow it and we keep messing it up because we still have to have that shift in here. And that shift in here will shape how we treat other people because we are assured in his love for us. I really hope we're getting this because this is vital. This is so important. This is what I have seen change me and my family and others. I hope you're buying into it too. Uh, we're not going to deal with the woman and who, 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 um, who Mary, who washed Jesus' feet because the point was Jesus dealt with her as far as she was able to go. And he blessed that. Whereas the Canaanite woman, it was a different situation. Again, how Jesus deals with us shaping how we deal with other people. All right, so let's go on now to Tuesday's lesson. Tuesday's lesson, presenting the truth. And look, because now I'm getting practical with this thing, right? If I've had this shift, if I recognize that, okay, people need Jesus, okay, but I know I need him more. <laughs> and there's a shift now and I see, okay, he loves me. Now we talk about sharing this and what will happen. One of the ways you know you've gone through the shift is not that you don't tell the truth, but you tell the truth in amazing love. That's a difference. So you could be talking about that. You be talking about truth, and you're able to smile. You be talking about truth and pointing out something that's really like, you know, hey, you know, you're just in the wrong way. But you're able to do that with a calmness and with the clarity that the person can't deny, but also the person wants, on some level, to hear. Not always, but it can happen. See, friendship alone does not win people to Christ. This is important. Just being friends doesn't mean I'm going to win you to Christ. There are a lot of people who pride themselves on all the people that they're friends with, all the sinners that they're friends with. Well, I understand the idea, but your friendship is not salvific. It's not just connection that changes. It's kind of like if somebody's stuck in a, you know, in, on the side of the road, you go look at them on the highway 
and you connect or you hitch up a bicycle to get his Dodge Ram 1500 or his Ford F250 out of the ditch. Well, just because I locked in and I linked up, that's not going to get them out of the ditch. What gets them out of the ditch is not just connection, not just friendship, but to whom are they connected? I got to connect that Ford F-250 to a Ford F-350, someone stronger, a Dodge Ram 1500 to that Dodge Ram 2500, something greater to pull them out of the ditch. Friendship or linking alone doesn't say it's friendship to whom the greater power. In fact, Jesus, that's the one and that's what saves. So that's why as friends to all these people who we say we're friends with, we got to bring truth. Truth that is greater than your situation. Truth that will show the way out of your lifestyle, that will show the way out of that sin, freeing you even from that sin. It's the truth, the Bible says, what? That sets us free. So when Jesus said, knowing the truth, and it's the truth that sets us free, we have another imperative that that truth, we got to trust the truth in its power, which allows us then to be able to prepare or to present it in love. See, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, we want to go there. Ephesians 4, 15, a lot of times, and I had to learn this, especially when it came to giving, quote, present truth. There are a lot of present truthers out there who pride themselves on the truth, but they're really not trusting the truth. What they're trusting is their ability to present it, or they're trusting the loudness with which they're saying it, or they're trusting the number of times of what they're saying, and they're not really presenting that truth in love because they're trusting themselves to accomplish the work rather than the truth to accomplish the work. And I had to learn that, unfortunately, the hard way, but I learned it. And I recognize here when it says, but speaking the truth in love, we may all grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. One way you know when you are trusting the truth and not yourself is how you're presenting said truth. In other words, if you're saying that truth and you've got sweat pouring out of it, eyes red, mouth screaming, spittle shooting out, and you're just demanding it. I've seen, I have seen that. And unfortunately, I have done that. And I realize the damage that it that does to the hearers. It, it, it makes truth something. It's terrible. It's terrible. You know, it's one thing for something to be broken, but then to watch something just get like torn down or, or, melted or or um, destroyed or defaced when you take the love of god and the truth of the gospel and you and you make it something ugly or you make it something mean or you make it something traumatic that's hurtful to the lord but it's also angering to him as well because it's a misrepresentation of what he and who he really is and so that's why this verse is so short. I mean, just like one little line, but it's it's life changing where the truth has to be presented in love. I had to learn this as a parent. I'm learning this as a parent, you know, with an 18 year old and a 13 year old where we have the six year old where sometimes it's easier with her to say, just do it. She's going to do it. I mean, she's six and she doesn't have a mind to, to think or do otherwise. But with a 13 year old, with an 18 year old, it's a whole different game. And, and I'm learning, by God's grace, I'm learning that the way forward and the way for them to come into right truth is not just now information, not just Bible stories per se, not just theology or doctrine, but it has to be presented with a smile. It has to come with a package that is equal to, that's consummate, or not consummate, but commensurate to what's being shared. So if the truth is something beautiful, if the truth is something you know great and marvelous, or any adjective you want to throw, our presentation has to be that way too. How how it's given, how it's going out, because it's the truth that saves and not me. 
not my friendship to you, not my relationship to you, whether it's father, husband, brother, uh, elder, pastor, whatever that relationship, that's not, it's the truth that changes you. And so when we speak it, we speak it in love. In fact, the lesson gives some some good good counsel here where it tells us, um, based on what we read up here, and we're going to talk and see this in a moment. Um, there are those, oh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot to bring it up for you guys. There are those, it says here, who seem to delight in looking for things that are wrong with others, if for no other reason than that it makes them feel better about themselves. Powerful, short paragraph, but powerful. See, the apostle Paul was opposite. He looked for the positive in the churches that he ministered to. See, this is one way you know you're presenting the truth and love because you revel in the good. You try to run through the bad. It doesn't mean you ignore the bad. Please, please, let, let me, please understand this. It doesn't mean that you overlook the bad. But I run through the bad to revel in the good. Because it's not my reveling in the bad that's going to make you be good. It's the truth that's going to make you do good. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ and the presence and power of his spirit that's going to convert you. My job, my responsibility, my task is to look for the good and the spirit will show you the bad. Now, does that mean if you up and ask me, is this wrong? I'm, I have a responsibility. Yeah, I have to tell you that's wrong. But me running around telling you what's wrong after I told you what's wrong, please, I... Oh, Lord, please help. Don't let my words get anything twisted or get in the way of your truth. Once I told you what's wrong, you know it. The first time I told you, and unless you have a mental or cognitive um, incapability, you know it's wrong. You know where I stand because I said it. Now, at that point, you know it's wrong. Me telling you over and over again it's wrong is not going to make you do right. The gospel method, Paul's method, Jesus's method was that I know you know what is wrong. I'm here to show you what's right. Now, when you don't know what's wrong, that's when that person needs to be edified, need to be told, hey, you know, this is not right. But once they know it's wrong, once they know it's not right, now that you know it, I'm going to show you why that's wrong by showing you what's right. I'm going to show you how that wrong, how that lifestyle is wrong. That choice is wrong. That way is wrong by living out what's right. That's hard. You know, it's hard because if it was easy, more people would be doing it. No, it's easier just to tell them, stop, stop. You're going to go to hell. Stop, stop. That's wrong. Because that's what the nature of us wants to do. We want to point it out because it's that whole whiplash effect. It's that whole rubbernecking effect. When you go by an accident, why do we look at the accident? Because we're so messed up as humans. We stare at the accident and we keep looking at what's going on, even after we know everybody's okay. Because there's a little part inside of us where we feel good that, whew, I'm glad that's not me. Whew, I'm so glad that's not me. And we cannot rubberneck. And we can't look at people in sin and rubberneck and not redeem. And the way we redeem is the way Jesus shows us, the way Paul taught here in 2 Thessalonians. Look here. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. How we don't have to just rubberneck how we can redeem. And we redeem not by, not by us saving. We redeem by example. We redeem by what we do, by how we live. Look at here. It says there in 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Oh, sorry. So Thessalonians chapter one. Look, look at the language here. Look at the language here. All right. It says, Paul and Sylvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians in God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single church that Paul wrote to was an imperfect church. Every single one. Some more imperfect than others. The church of Corinth, they were they were worse than the, the Thessalonian church. The Thessalonians didn't have the issues they were having in Corinth, but the Thessalonian church was not perfect. How do we know that? If they were perfect, they wouldn't need an epistle. If they were perfect, they wouldn't need a word. So whether it was a church in Rome, Thessalonica, Galatia, whatever, they all were not perfect, right? So now with that in mind, 
grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded. These are positive words. These are words of affirmation for the good that they are done. The good that they are done, done. <laughs> the good that they're doing. Now, later on in both First Thessalonians and Second, he's going to deal with stuff that they need to be edified on, stuff that they were being shaky on. One of the things that they were being shaky on was um, the, the nature of the dead. And he dealt with the resurrection there in First Thessalonians uh, chapter four. And so he didn't start out saying, you know what, you guys, y'all don't understand what's going on. He, he didn't revel on that. He runs through that. He deals with it to revel in the positive. He even greets them in the positive, saying, man, you've been hearing some great things, how your faith is growing and how the love among you, you all have real, you have a real sense of community. All those things he commends, he recognizes, and then he shares the issues. He deals with them, but he doesn't revel in them. This is what I'm learning even as a parent. Because sometimes I'll go on and on talking about what my children or what my child is doing. And it's I know when it's happening. I know when I'm doing it because my wife just tired, just looks at me. <laughs> She's just looking at me. And you know, you know when your children are just like they're they're listening to you, but they're not hearing you. Or they're hearing, but they're not listening. And you just get frustrated. I get frustrated, like, just listen to what I'm saying. Da, da, da. And I'm I mean. I'm talking about it in my head. Let me be careful because you can only go by what I'm telling you, right? And I don't, praise the Lord, I don't like scream and vent and holler like I used to. But I will go on and on and on and on. Um, and now the Lord is leading me. He's gro He's growing me to say, okay, Chris, all right, now you trust in the truth, right? Okay, you're trusting the truth to do the work and not your words. Once you've said it, forget it. Once you shared it, show it. Don't spend a lot of time talking about it anymore. Just show it now. Show why what you just said is true. And that can take days. That can take weeks. That can take months. But guess what? Everything that you're going to eat today, everything that you ate today, it took days. It took weeks. It took months. But it matured to a point to where now you were able to eat it. It was ready for harvest. Don't give up on the harvest just because it takes a long time. We've got to have the attitude that Paul had. We've got to pray for the spirit of Christ to be in our hearts so that we run through the negative. Not that we run around it. Not that we dodge it. And we definitely don't deny it. We don't lie. Which is another thing he was talking to the Thessalonian church about. The, being aware of the Antichrist, the great liar that would come. But we run through the wrong to revel in the right, to revel in the positive, so that we strengthen up those things that are weak by, by focusing on those things that are strong. Say that again. We strengthen those things that are weak by focusing on those areas that are strong. Same thing happens in exercise and in exercise physiology taking some additional courses and learning about that even now and trying to get some certifications and, and realizing how when you're dealing with, with, with fitness and when you're trying to grow stronger, um, you can't just focus on the weak areas. You have to find your points of strength in that fitness regimen or in that exercise, because when you find your point of strength, it's by staying and using that point of strength that you build up the area of weakness you build up the area that is not as strong. So that's why this whole ethic and this whole idea and attitude is, is, is life-changing, even in a physical sense. So let's go on, y'all, because I know I'm just talking, <laughs> uh, but I pray that the Spirit is speaking. Because when you go to Wednesday's lesson, as we get this thing through, talking about the foundation um, of accepting, having an accepting attitude, to help in this process of focusing on the positive in our attitude adjustment and trying to make friends for Jesus and have a winning attitude to do it. The accepting attitude, delineating what this accepting is. It's not a call to accepting sin. 
the call to accepting sinners. We have never, neither will we ever be asked by the master and the God of all things good and glorious to accept sin. It, it's, not, it's not his program, it's not his regimen. And if you ever doubt or ever wonder if that's what Jesus is asking us to do, always remember that if Jesus was asking us to be accepting of sin, accepting of evil, accepting of injustice, accepting of wrong, he would have done that all before the cross. If sin's not a big deal, if sin can just be erased or just overlooked or just glanced over, then why is it then that he bled, suffered, and died the way he did for something that could have just been edited? No, sin is serious. It's so serious that it led to the death of God. Now to understand then how and remember and recognize the seriousness of this, what are we to accept then? We definitely are not talking about accepting sin. What we're talking about is receiving sinners, people, souls. That's why it says here in Romans 15, 7, wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us. To the glory of God. Gotta got root in this verse. Let this verse marinate in your soul because we've got to receive each other the way Christ received us. Think of all the people that Jesus received. I'm thinking of one brother. He was very smart. In fact, he had a financial acumen, he was gifted with money. He was attractive. He was a charismatic individual and naturally gifted in a lot of ways. But he had a problem. This brother had an issue and his issue was greed, selfishness. And it prevented him from following Jesus through Gethsemane and to Calvary. You might know who I'm talking about. Because this man hung himself. This man was Judas. This is all and these are all of the issues that Judas had in light of all the positives. But when you look at his life and you look at his life with Christ, how does the master receive him? At no point did Jesus ever condone Judas's Judasing. In fact, up to the very end, he was calling him out of it when he said, what thou doest, do it quickly. He wasn't telling him to go out of the room quickly. He was saying, repent. What you need to do, you need to hurry up and do it now. Because when you go out of this room, you're going into darkness. Your probation will close because you are closing the door on me. And Jesus received him for the duration of his ministry. No record do we have of Jesus rejecting him. He rejected his greed. He rejected his selfishness. He even rebuked it. He preached against it. He taught against it. He prophesied against it. And still, he received him, even at the very end. So now stepping back from Jesus to Judas, how can we justify mistreating people or not receiving them the way Christ received us. Even if these people have done us wrong, or even if these people are out of the way, even if these people are living lifestyles that are in total contradiction to scripture, we gotta receive them as Christ received us, but not receive what they do. This is a supernatural word because it's very easy in our natural mind to go to one extreme or the other. The other extreme is, oh, just, just, just love everybody. You know, just, just love everybody. Just let them in. And we've got to be mindful that I want you. I don't want that lifestyle. I want you. I don't want that sin, though. In fact, we're in this place because we are the 
called out ones. That's what ecclesia means. That's what the church is. The church is the called out ones. Remember, our very focus in memory text is 1 Peter 3, that we are sanctified. That means set apart. So our welcoming attitude is welcoming souls, not sin. You got to leave that sin at the door. In fact, we can be freed of that because the doors of this church are open saying, whoever will come to Jesus, let him set you free. Let him put his spirit in you and you walk in victory. You walk in the light of his glory. That is what it means to be a church. It doesn't mean you come up in here, we welcome you, we love you, and we want you. We want you. We don't want your homosexuality. We want you. We don't want your adultery. We want you. We don't want your dopamine addiction. We want you. We don't want your alcoholism. That stuff is terrible. Why? Not because you're bad. It's bad. It's so bad, it killed my Jesus. It's so bad, it almost killed me. I don't want that in your life. And we are here as a people of God to show you the way out of that way. And that way is Jesus. So this is where we are in being kind to one another. Ephesians chapter 4, 32. Tender, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. I didn't know a lot about tenderizing as a vegetarian, but I remember when I was eating meat, and I like I didn't really see that or my didn't see my mom you know, using a tenderizer, you know, to prepare meat. So I didn't really understand the concept of what tender meant. But many of you do that a tenderizer is that big mallet. In fact, let me see if I got enough time. Uh, a tenderizer. That mallet. And I know most tenderizers some people use a tenderizer that is, um, uh, you know, the chemicals you know stuff they spray on to tenderize the meat. But when he says there, be kind to one another, tender hearted, this is, this is, this is the thing right here. This is the deal. This is the meat mallet, right? Now, what's the purpose of the meat mallet? The meat mallet is what beats on the meat to help break down the tissue of the muscle, which is the flesh, so that it's tender or easier to masticate or to chew. So you're literally beating the meat up. You're, you know, you're, you're going at it to break it down, to break down those fibers, those tendons, so that they become easier to chew, right? So that's from the meat perspective. So when you jump over here to first Peter, excuse me, Ephesians four, and he says, be kind to one another, tender hearted. Saints, the Lord, the spirit has been beaten on some of our stony hearts, trying to make them hearts of flesh, tenderizing them so that we will be able to forgive one another. This thing is powerful. Please catch this point. Some of us wonder why the Lord allows us to go through things that hurt us or go through things that break our heart. The Lord doesn't break hearts. He tenderizes hearts. He softens hearts. And sometimes we've gone through or we go through a tragedy or a trauma that the Lord is allowed to happen or that the Lord is using for the process of tenderizing softening our hearts to see what it's like when we hurt him, to see what it's like to have a heart that is sympathetic and not just sympathetic, but even empathetic to others, even to the point of forgiving them. Because ultimately the forgiving heart is a tender heart. It's a heart that recognizes you need something from me and I'm the only one that can give it to you. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. It's no different than, you know, the guy who's standing at the corner on Walmart in front of Walmart or who's standing there with the sign, you know, please help. When we spend all our time wondering the reasons why to not help that person versus, you know what, if I'm going to be wrong, let me be wrong giving them something. What they do with it, whatever. Okay, but let if I'm an heir, err on the side of generosity. That's what a tender heart does. A tender heart doesn't think of all the reasons to not help someone. It just needs one reason to help the person, and you do it. 
I have to commend, and, and, and I, one thing I recognize, my father-in-law, he is a very tender-hearted guy. And I know that because of how he treats people. If he sees anybody who is standing on the corner or who is, um, you know, has a sign up, immediately I'll see him go to give them something without fail. And frankly, it's embarrassed me sometimes. I felt like, man, you know, I need to step my game up. I feel, I feel ashamed, and rightfully so, because my heart should be tender enough, as he says. I don't know when that might be me. And I know what it's like, and I'm going to do what I can to help. So I commend you, Papa Sims, for setting that example. And I commend every tender-hearted Christian, because here's the deal. Tender-hearted Christians are a lot of times the overlooked Christians. A lot of times people will take advantage of that tenderness. And a lot of times you will find yourself on the short end of the stick in this life. Let me emphasize, in this life, because what this verse is saying is, be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You, as the tenderhearted saint, you have the assurance of Jesus's forgiveness. Now, whether or not people treat you right or take advantage of that or whatever, they're going to have to answer to, for that. But the reward that you have, even greater than heaven itself, is the peace of mind knowing I'm forgiven. Y'all can run over me. Y'all can overlook me. You can even take advantage of me and my being tender. But I know I'm forgiven. So when he comes, I'm going up out of here. <laughs> I'm raising up out of here and you won't be able to stop me. You might not see me now. You might be taking advantage of me now, but when you're looking at me up in the air, being caught up to meet my Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, then you'll know, oh, amen and amen. It pays to have a tender heart. It doesn't always pay dividends in this life. It doesn't always pay dividends in this world. In fact, you won't get hired having a tender heart. It will be the Lord whose grace and mercy gives you that position. If you're making the decision, I'm going to be a tender hearted Christian. It will be the Lord who will change that person and who will affect them because your tenderness is a total opposite of attitudes, a total opposite of fight for your rights. It's a total opposite of what we naturally do. But it's exactly what Jesus is saying. This is how we have the attitude that we have. We think of the lesson. It's the accepting attitude that is treating people the way Jesus treats us. Let's wrap this thing up, y'all, as we go into Thursday's lesson, because We've been covering a lot of ground. And as we talk about truth being lovingly presented, these are just some, some verses that we want to close out with that when the time comes for us to show this tenderness, when the time comes for us to show the gospel, when the time comes for us to, to, to deal with others, these are verses that we want to claim. These verses right here, and we're going to go ahead and close. First Peter is the first one. We read it already. But we're going to close with these verses. And we make our transition. All right, First Peter is where we're going to start here. Uh, lovingly presenting the truth. We want to claim these verses as our power source. Remember, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Remember, you're sanctified. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in that moment, as we're going to learn here this afternoon, at that moment, you enter into sanctification, which is then moment by moment, living in Jesus Christ. That's why the verse says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What kind of hearts? The tender heart. And the tender heart is always ready to give an answer to every man that asks with the reason of the hope that is in you. And he does it, she does it how? With meekness and with fear. For years I read this verse and I thought, be ready. That means you gotta be ready to break it down. Be ready to quote the verses. Be ready to show them why this is the day. All of this stuff. But he says, you're ready with the spirit of meekness and fear. Another word for that fear is love. With humility and love. That's able to share the truth, even if you're not going to accept it. It's okay. I'm ready to explain what you may not be ready to accept. But I'm ready to share it. it says there in 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. 
be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Hear the balance. When we talked about the idea of having the accepting attitude, I'm accepting sinners, not sin. I'm accepting you, not what you do. And when we do that, we have to rebuke. We have to reprove. And also we have to exhort. In other words, for every put down, you got to be ready to give at least two put ups. <laughs> there is a movie here that talks about a family where if the child gives a put down or if the child says something bad about their sibling, they have to then say two good things about their sibling. Um, if you're ready to give a put down, we're naturally ready to do that. Right. And it's easy to do that. It's much easier to knock something down than it is to build it up. Reprove and rebuke, but also exhort, lift up, run through the negative and rebel in the positive, especially when it comes to how we deal with our children and with our husbands and wives and family. Titus chapter three, verse four to five finishes it out. What does it say, y'all? Read it together, please. It says what? But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man and peer. What was the that? The that is all the stuff that we did before we accepted Christ. The that is all the stuff that we do before we surrender to the Lord, even now, today. After that, the kindness and love of God of our Savior toward man appeared. And that's what we got to do. Our kindness and our love, it has to be able to appear even after that, even after we're mistreated, even after someone's rejected what we're trying to give them. And this is not done by works of righteousness because it's not by works of righteousness, which we've done. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is amazing stuff, amazing stuff, because it's the doctrine of being a Christian that makes being a Christian unlike anything you could ever be. That's why I don't care what you are, whatever you call yourself, how, whatever you find your identity in. If I said, who are you? And, and there's a scene in the movie Overcomer where the guy in the bed asks the coach come in, he says, who are you? And he goes to this long list of saying who he is, how he says he's a man, how he says he's a husband, how he says uh, he's a coach, he's a teacher, uh, how he says he's white, how he says he's a male. He goes through all this list and near the end of the list, he says, I'm a Christian. So the brother in the bed challenges him and he says, OK, these are all the things that you are. And he asked him if being a Christian was important. And he said, yeah, it's really important. Well, if it was so important, he asked them, then why did you say it so low on the list? Why was it so far down the list on how you identified yourself? And when we think about ourselves as Christians and when we try to identify and label ourselves, do we see ourselves as all these things? And then somewhere in the mix, Christians, I want to submit to us that because of what Jesus did, because of what he died for, there is no greater label. There is no more important title. There is no important reality or existence or identity that we have other than being Christians, Christians, the sons and daughters of God, the saints claimed ransomed by Jesus Christ. I want to be a Christian, like the song says, and you wanting to be a Christian. And I have to learn me wanting to be a Christian. That's not going to make me a Christian. I got to be made over. The maker makes me a Christian. Jesus has promised to make me a Christian. He's promised and we claim it in first Peter three to sanctify himself in our hearts. We're going to talk about that this afternoon in our message. And we're talking about life by the spirit of, of Christ. But right now, we want to open the door and ask all who want to be a Christian, who want to live out all the stuff we've been talking about in this lesson, let's pray for him to do it. Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word and a chance to be together, recognizing that this is a miracle and there's only one miracle worker, you. We're praying that you would do this miracle in our hearts and that you'd be born in us today, that we would have an attitude adjustment. Forgive us for our attitude that we've had in the past and how we've looked at others because of how we really didn't understand how you looked at us. 
as you shape and change and shift and still teach us how you're perceiving us, let that now be a part of how we treat, transfer to how we deal with others and how we make friends by being friendly. This is our prayer. Thank you so much for giving us another chance to come to you and to stay with you, Jesus. Amen.